Welcome to Autism Knows No Borders. Discover what's possible when people impacted by autism inspire change and build community. Together with the Global Autism Project, here's your host, Rachel Harmon. Hello, everyone. Our guest today is Dr. Stephen Shore. Dr. Shore is an autistic professor of special education at Adelphi University. He has written several books, including College for Students with Disabilities, Understanding Autism for Dummies, Ask and Tell, and Beyond the Wall. Currently, Dr. Shore serves on the boards of Autism Speaks, the Asperger Syndrome and High Functioning Autism Association, the U.S. Autism and Asperger Association, the Scientific Council of OAR, and other autism-related organizations. He formerly headed the Asperger's Association of New England and was on the board of the Autism Society of America. In this conversation, we discuss Stephen's background and how his parents helped in his development, how autism affects his everyday life, his strengths related to autism, benefits of music for autistic people, what Stephen describes as the four A's of autism, the controversies surrounding ABA therapy and Autism Speaks, awareness of autism around the world, meaningful inclusion strategies, and disclosure and self-advocacy. In this episode, discover what's possible when A is for action. For more information about Dr. Shore and his work, please visit our show notes at autismknowsnoborders.com. We appreciate your time. If you enjoy this podcast and you'd like to support our mission, please take just a few seconds to share it with one person who you think will find value in it too. You can also follow us on Instagram at Autism Podcast, subscribe to our YouTube channel, Global Autism Project, and join our community on Mighty Networks at community.globalautismproject.org. And now I present you, Dr. Stephen Shore. Hi, Stephen. Welcome to Autism Knows No Borders. Thank you for being here today. Well, it's great to be here. Honored to be with you. Could you please briefly introduce yourself? Sure. Yeah, I am a, an autistic professor at Adelphi University, a professor of special education, where my focus is on teaching and researching into issues related to the autism spectrum. Now, I said I'm an autistic professor because at 18 months, I was struck with the regressive autism bomb. And like what happens to about 30% of us on the spectrum, I lost functional communication, had meltdowns, withdrew from the environment, and in brief, I became a very autistic little kid. There was so little known about autism in those days that it took my parents a year to find a place for diagnosis. And when they did, the doctor said, well, your kid's too sick, send him off to an institution, because that's what they did in those days. Fortunately, my parents, like we see ever-increasing Numbers of parents around the world, they advocated on my behalf, and they convinced the school to take me in about a year. And it was during that year my parents implemented what we would today refer to as an intensive home-based early intervention program. And that was a program emphasizing music, movement, sensory integration, narration, and imitation. My parents, that's just today's terminology because in those days, the concept of early intervention didn't even exist. However, it didn't work. This was back in the 60s, right? Yeah, that's correct. It didn't work? It didn't work, perhaps due to a difference in mirror neurons, making it difficult for us autistic people, especially when young, to imitate. So my parents flipped it around and they imitated me. And once I did that, or once they did that, I became aware of them in my environment. And they were able to move me along to a point where speech began to return at age four. And I think the key implication is that in order to do solid and authentic work with an autistic person, you have to develop a trusting relationship first by meeting them where they are. And I think that holds true for everybody else as well. Yeah. Well, did you always know that you were different? Uh, yeah, I did. 
My parents used the word autism in the house just like any other word. So at about age five and a half, when my speech had pretty much normalized and had sufficient awareness of what was going on, I knew I had this thing called autism. We didn't know much about what it was, but it helped explain a lot of differences. What was it like for you growing up in school with other classmates? Well, uh, after um, going to a special preschool, it was uh, public school kindergarten at age six, where I was a social and academic catastrophe. Now, you know what happens to people who are different in grade school. And fortunately, school systems are beginning to realize that bullying is not a developmental phase that people need to go through but rather something needs to be done about it. Mm. So that is good. Academically, I was usually about a grade behind in most of my subjects. However, I would enjoy going to school because I could go into the library and get all the books on my favorite subject, whatever it happened to be at that time. And i just read them and take notes and copy diagrams. Sometimes even wonder if there was more to school than just reading my favorite books. Did you have any friends growing up? I had some. Yeah, I did. Not too many, usually one or two at a time. I was much happier at home where I could hang out with my family, various pets, dogs, cats, and uh, just engage in whatever I was interested in, such as chemistry or astronomy or whatever the subject was. We had a nice world book encyclopedia, and I'd have fun reading that each volume one at a time from cover to cover. Mm -hmm. So throughout the years, were you able to develop some coping strategies to deal with any kinds of challenges that you were feeling? Yeah, I was, uh, was able to. I would uh, be more interested in reading science-y type things. I'd spend more time doing that. My parents would often tell me or instruct me um, how to react or interact or behave in various situations. But nobody really knew anything about strategies for autism in those days. That was even before ABA become widely known. There was a primordial variation of that called behavior management. But it seemed like my parents engaged in more of what we would today refer to as a cognitive or developmental relational approach. But those approaches uh, certainly weren't around in those days either. Mm -hmm. Did you receive any support as you transitioned into adulthood? Not really. I pretty much had to figure out things myself. Although my parents did implement what we would today call a transition to college program. So often we hear about programs where Autistic students in high school, perhaps in the summer before they would go to college, can visit the campus and maybe the structure program for a couple of days. What my parents did is they'd say, take a few days off of school and go with your older sister to the university and hang out with her. That's basically what it was. And that, that was my college transition program. Mm. The first time I did that, I realized that college was something I really wanted to do because people were friendly, there were no more bullies, and it was just a good time. Did you have any role models? I had some friends that I made when I joined a bicycling club, and some of them were older than I am. So uh, I guess in some ways they were role models. I didn't have any, you, know, you might say, uh, hero role models uh, like uh, Superman or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I guess I mean more like an autistic advocate that you looked up to, that could you could relate to in regards to autism. Well, as I was growing up, there wasn't enough information about autism in those days. Mm -hmm. Because at that time, autism was considered to be this rare psychiatric disorder uh, caused by poor parenting, specifically uh, poor mothering. So there wasn't knowledge about people such as Temple Grandin and, and others uh, that we have now. There wasn't an opportunity to develop any autistic role models. Mm -hmm. 
So how does autism affect your everyday life today? Yeah, well, uh, that's a, a lot of people ask me that question. It still does. Fortunately, I've managed to work around a lot of the challenges of autism and stay in areas of, you might say, high functioning. One area that autism affects me is uh, lighting. Many autistic people have various sensory challenges. Recessed lighting fixtures for me, being under one of those, is like looking into a spotlight for most people. So here is the accommodation. Your hat. You're right. Many people may think the hat's a fashion statement, and I guess in some ways it is. And it's always good to support my university whenever possible. (laughs) But really, it's an accommodation. I mentioned I teach at a university. So some challenges that autism still brings there are certainly the visual sensory issues, sometimes distracting auditory challenges occur, facial recognition, remembering faces is a common challenge for autistic people. And what that translates to is that it takes me a whole semester to begin to remember my students, to be able to recognize them. And that's a positive for online education or Zoom-based education because everybody's got their name in their little squares. Mm -hmm. So there's no more issues of remembering names. In the bad old pre-pandemic days, I would have students write their names on name tents that they put on their desk. And also I would disclose to my students that I'm really horrible at remembering faces and that's just a part of autism. Mm -hmm. What are your strengths related to autism? It's good to talk about strengths, mainly because with autism, a characteristic that's not often mentioned is the widely varying skill set. And what that tends to mean is that the things we're good at, we're very good at. The things we're not so good at, we may need a lot of support. So understanding mechanical devices is a strength. At age four, I was found by my parents taking apart a watch with a sharp knife. I'd pop open the back, remove the motor, extract the gears, spin them around, and then put it all back together again. The watch still worked, and there weren't any pieces left over. At age four? At age four. Wow, yeah. So then there's the question, how could I have the fine motor control to take apart a watch? But I was a disaster when it came to penmanship. Both require fine motor control. And what this is an example of is the that widely varying skill set that we have and a demonstration of the sharp lines of demarcation between the abilities that autism gives us and also the real challenges and disabilities that can come with autism as well. Strengths now, uh, well, I can still take apart watches and bicycles and other devices and put them back together again. As for teaching, I think autism, being autistic, helps me break things down into little organized pieces. Uh, It's helpful for teaching students and engaging with students about various subjects. I am uh, visually based, like Temple Grandin, like I think most autistic people, not all. I know some autistic people are so non-visually based that they can't read a map. But me being a visually based person, that really helps with developing PowerPoint and slide presentations and presenting materials in a visual way, which seems to be helpful for a lot of students. Mm Mm-hmm. And you also have a background in music. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. One of your bachelor's degrees is in music education, and you have a master's in music from Boston University, correct? Yeah, that's correct. And I did all of the doctoral coursework in music education. But then as I was taking my comprehensive exams and studying for those, I became more interested in autism. So I defected to the School of Education and got my doctorate in special education. But I still enjoy music, listen to it, and uh, give music lessons to autistic children. Great. Yeah, I, I've completed the coursework to become a music therapist, and now I'm just oh, cool. needing to find time to finish my internship. 
So I definitely can attest to the power of music and how it can help children and just, I guess, anyone really. So how has music played a role in your life? Well, music was the part of my, what we would today refer to as an early intervention program, where there was a lot of music, movement, sensory integration, narration, and imitation. So even from very young, I remember we would, uh, the radio would be on almost all the time, listening mostly to classical music. And we'd sing to music, move to music, and basically do everything to music. And also I had music lessons from age, starting at age six. And I think the best thing I learned from those piano lessons at age six was how not to teach an autistic person how to play an instrument. <laughs> Could you elaborate on that? Typical music lessons spend a lot of time talking about things, such as where is middle C? Mm -hmm. yeah, and this is how you play it. And for an autistic person, it needs to be much more immediate and experiential. And so, for example, when I look at a lot of the first music books, it could be piano, it could be another instrument, there's often a lot of bright and distracting pictures and pre-music reading exercises to sort of transition into learning how to read music. However, they seem, they're seem they confusing to me, and if I can't figure them out, then I certainly can't teach that to anybody else. So what I do with autistic people is that we begin with creating the materials that will be used to help them learn how to read music. So that involves writing and cutting and matching and categorizing, and that's what it is from the viewpoint of the autistic person. Uh, at least at the beginning. And then as that matching continues, it extends to, say, the piano keyboard, where we're taping little stickies onto the keys with the names of the notes and identifying them and playing with them and also putting them on a, a big drawing of a staff that we've created and learning the lines and spaces that way, and then matching that to a keyboard or whatever instrument is uh, being learned. Usually it's keyboard or it's a recorder. And that way we transition into note reading, notation, and that makes it easy to transition into instrument book number one. Because there's two challenges when beginning to read music with the first uh, music teaching book. And that is, one, you have to figure out how the book works. And two, you also have to figure out how to read music at the same time. So if you already know how to read music, at least partially, that part is familiar. And then two, I tend to use the Alfred Complete Adult Piano Method book, if it's on piano, even if I'm working with a uh, small child. And the reason why is that the work we do fills in that transition to reading music. And also it tends to be very simple. And there aren't all these distracting pictures and diagrams that we can go directly into it. And if, depending upon the student's ability, there's a number of activities within the book and exercise that focus on learning more about note reading and even some elementary music theory that we can engage in. Mm -hmm. What do you like about teaching music? Well, one, it's just fun. Music is just fun and enjoyable to engage with on its own right. Also, music can either provide a means of communication or it can supplement and help an autistic person organize their communication. So I've had students, for example, who were functionally non-speaking and they communicated in other ways. But when we played the piano or if I played the piano, they would sing. And they would sing with the words to the song and uh, nobody would know that they're non-speaking unless you knew them uh, beforehand. And they sounded like anybody else. So I think there's an interesting link there between music and spoken communication. Mm -hmm. So it's just fun, and it gives the student a chance to have something that they can be good at, even if there are many other challenges. Yeah, there's definitely that link. There have been studies showing, for example, adults who have 
encountered a traumatic brain injury and are kind of relearning how to speak, music therapy can be really beneficial to that. And putting the words together through a song and lyrics to kind of shape into spoken language. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's a lot there. There is research suggesting that early exposure to keyboard music increases neural connections within the corpus callosum in the brain. And we also know that the corpus callosum in people on the autism spectrum tends to be smaller or thinner. So anything that increases those neural connections, uh, you might say is a no-brainer. You should do it. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever written your own music, or do you like to read music primarily? All of the above. As I was getting my music degrees, I took some composition courses and composed some music. I enjoyed doing that. I also enjoyed arranging music. So taking a symphonic piece, for example, and transcribing it for a brass choir or a brass quintet, that was always fun. And also stealing other, as a trombone player, stealing other instrumental uh, concerti mm -hmm. and other pieces. So playing uh, pieces that would normally be played on a French horn or a violin and playing them on the trombone. That was always fun. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I grew up playing classical piano and improvising and arranging and composing has been a challenge for me. I haven't really practiced it enough. But what I love about reading music is it's like reading a story in a book. Oh, sure. You know, you're kind of learning what the composer is trying to express and then being able to hear it for the first time as you're playing it. There's something beautiful about that storytelling and just kind of flipping the page to see where it goes next. It's really exciting. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's communication between you and the composer. You might have written that piece of music a hundred or more years ago. Yeah, exactly. That's pretty cool. I was preparing for a recital one year and had to play Chopin's Fantasy Impromptu and was struggling, was really struggling. And I remember kind of talking to the Chopin god <laughs> and asking for yeah. help and guidance to get through it. No, well, that's, uh, that's neat. Yeah. And if you go to Poland, there's a lot of Chopin. There's Chopin International Airport and there's Chopin oh. uh, wine and uh, various other things. It's pretty funny. Yeah. So, well, I would say for our listeners who are interested in learning more about music therapy, we have an episode specifically dedicated to it. It's episode 23 with Pamela Fisher, who is a music therapist in Australia. Okay, Stephen, let's talk about your advocacy work. So you've spoken extensively about the four A's of autism. Could you describe what each A stands for and kind of walk us through the different phases? Yeah, yeah, I certainly can. And it's always interesting to present on those uh, four A's nationally and internationally, uh, see what responses I get and where people are in that journey. So it is a journey. And it begins, uh, whether it's an individual on the autism spectrum, it could be a parent, it could be an organization, or even an entire country. And it begins with awareness. That's the first A. So a number of organizations, large and small, regional, all the way through national in scope, have been working on awareness. We have Autism Awareness Day, Autism Awareness Month. Sometimes I think of it as uh, Don't Forget Your Autistic Month in <laughs> April. And what all of that has done is that it's increased societal awareness of autism to be able to recognize autism, whether it's at home, in school, in the community, in employment, and increasing numbers of autistic people in themselves as they read about it and then get and confirm their suspicions with a more formal diagnosis. So we've gone from what was considered a rare psychiatric disorder of 1 in 10,000 to now where the Center for Disease Control accepts a prevalence rate of 1 in 54. So that's a lot of autism. Mm -hmm. So there's all kinds of discussions and questions and controversies as to how much of that is caused by 
say, an increase in autism for various reasons? Or has autism always been here, and maybe we're now just better at recognizing autism when we see it, or some combination of the two? And what that does is build a solid foundation for the next step, which is acceptance. And that second A, acceptance, is when we see people turning from working against autism. So turning away from the idea that, well, that we could cure autism or eliminate autism and recognizing that autistic characteristics can be good to work with. And there are a number of characteristics that can be helpful to the person and helpful to society in general. And it's also characterized by using strength-based approaches. So an example might be, let's say we have a school-age child who's reluctant to do mathematics. Maybe they're just not good at it, they've had bad experience, whatever it is. They just don't want to be involved in it. So commonly what would happen is an observation of that individual would occur and they do an interest inventory. What is the child into? What are their strengths? What are their abilities? Also, what are their challenges as well? So we find out this child enjoys using a flight simulator on a computer. As a matter of fact, they live to do that. And they run home and that's how they spend their time at home when they're not eating and doing other things. So that is identified as a powerful reinforcer. And a plan is set up where if a child does, reaches their goals in math, then they get time to use the flight simulator. Flight simulator is considered as a motivator. However, that's still working against the characteristics of autism. And with acceptance, we work with the characteristics and would find ways to directly use that strength and ability to teach mathematics. There's plenty of mathematics involved in flying airplanes. And then what happens is mathematics now becomes intrinsically reinforcing because it's directly uh, has a benefit to getting even better uh, using that flight simulator. So that's acceptance. And that can be done, that occurs on a personal level, parental level, organization, even entire countries. So Autism Speaks, for example, they were firmly in the awareness stage, letting everybody know about autism, and at the same time focused on curing and eliminating autism. And until they began to realize that, well, this autism thing is here to stay, and it may be something that we can work with. And to this point, now they, uh, I sit on their board as an autistic person. They have an autistic person as a vice president. And they change their mission statement away from cure and elimination of autism to they still got the awareness thing going, but they've added appreciation and lifelong supports, which suggests that the organization realizes that autism is here to stay and that we're going to work with it. Mm -hmm. And what that does is set the stage for the third A, which is appreciation. And appreciation is where autistic people are valued for what we can contribute to society because we're autistic, not in spite of being autistic. And we see that in some of the larger IT companies such as Apple, Microsoft, SAP, Google, and others that actively seek autistic individuals because they know that a certain number of us can do various things in IT better and faster than non-autistic people due to autistic characteristics. Now, that said, whenever I hear about this uh, super IT autistic geekery, I always ask, what about everybody else? Because autistic computer geekery occurs in a minority, a small minority of autistic people. So it's one of those stereotypes. Yeah. It's big enough for these companies to notice, and they should, and publicize it and all that's good too. But I know many autistic people who have strengths in other areas and also autistic people who perhaps have more challenges. And for example, it makes me think of an individual I know of in Florida who needs a lot more supports. 
you'd probably be diagnosed as needing level two or level three supports. So that means support for communication, for uh, transportation, managing daily schedules. However, he has this curious interest in taking laundry out of a dryer and folding it perfectly. And he does it pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. And I know many people who would like help with their laundry. And he'd be happy to help you too. But you'd have to pay him to do it. Because that is his job. And he spends all day at a hot laundromat pulling laundry out of a dryer. He probably gets some desired sensory input out of that. Just like a cat that jumps into a pile of freshly laundered clothes. And uh, he enjoys doing that job, and he's productive, and he's fulfilled, and he's contributing to society, focusing on his abilities and his strengths. And then there's that fourth A, which is action. And action is the work that we have to do to recognize autism when it exists, to focus on using strength-based approaches, supporting autistic people, and then finding ways to appreciate the strengths of autistic people and the contributions to society we can make. Yeah. You're talking about, you know, using what is motivating to the child, what is reinforcing, and turning it into an intrinsic reinforcer so that it also becomes functional in whatever they're doing. And this brings up the point of ABA, which you mentioned earlier in the conversation too, applied behavior analysis. What are your thoughts on ABA and this movement towards reforming it to include some of these more informed practices? Uh, Well, I think that's good. ABA in its strictest sense is uh, operant conditioning. So increasing desired behaviors by with reinforcers or rewards and decreasing undesired behaviors with punishments, although these days it's mostly ignoring the behavior. And the brain is considered as a black box. You've got inputs at one end and you got reactions uh, at the other. And that's the most strict basic sense. ABA has come a long way since that time. And I see uh, increasing numbers of ABA practitioners considering developmental aspects and emotional aspects and inner constructs of autistic individuals and also working with autistic individuals. There's a lot of controversy about ABA in the autistic community. ABA is the only approach I know where autistic people report being traumatized and developing a sort of post-traumatic stress syndrome uh, reaction from what I would consider as misapplied ABA. Some practitioner or practitioners got a little overzealous, perhaps on discrete trial training on various things. And that that can be traumatic. Mm -hmm. Another point is that since ABA is the most widely used approach, there's more of a chance of bad ABA to be practiced. And I think that may be part of what gives ABA a bad name amongst many autistic people, is that there's a lot of poor ABA out there. Mm -hmm. ABA does have a place as a comprehensive treatment model right alongside with the developmental approaches such as the Miller Method, floor time, RDI, daily life therapy, which is kind of in a category in and of itself. It's kind of just like good education, uh, this teach, certs, and there's others. So I believe that as long as an approach is well-researched and it's well thought out, then we can consider that for a particular autistic person. And I think what we need to focus more on is not trying to figure out which approach is the best approach, which approach best fits the needs of that individual at this time. So there may be people who do, would do really well with an ABA approach. And then there'll be others who will do much better with, say, floor time or some other developmental, relational, or cognitive approach. And you can't say one's better than the other, but you can say one is better for a particular person than the other. Mm -hmm. And with ABA, I think as more autistic adults are speaking up about their experiences with the therapy, we're able to learn what has caused trauma 
and apply the changes so that it's more person-centered and, like you were saying before, meeting the child where they are and building on those strengths rather than just merely trying to normalize the person. Right. So that's a, that's a difference between normalizing a person or making the person, in the words of Eva Lovas, indistinguishable from their peers and having that as a goal to what we see now much more often, which is helping the autistic person be the best autistic person they can be with their characteristics. And if there are strategies from ABA that can help that happen in a humane manner, then sure, let's go for it if it works for that child. And the same goes with any of the other approaches and techniques that we have. Yeah. Okay, Stephen, another point that you made when talking about Autism Speaks is their shift in attitudes from awareness to now in that acceptance phase. But there still is a lot of resentment within the autism community towards Autism Speaks. And I'm wondering, do you get any backlash from being on the board, any criticism from other autistic individuals? And how do you respond to that? Sure, there's still a lot of resentment towards Autism Speaks. They did some horrible things. And the people inside Autism Speaks throughout the organization, including their highest levels of management, realize the mistakes that they've made. So we've made efforts to change them. I only agreed to join the Autism Speaks board because I realized I could see that they were ready for change. Mm -hmm. And they were. They were ready for change, and they are changing. It's a big organization. It's a research-based organization, and it probably will remain a research-based organization. There's a lot of call for increasing the amount of supports that Autism Speaks gives to autistic people, and they do do some of that, which is good. This is a vice president of services and supports, and, but it's still a primarily research organization, and it's the right of every organization to decide what they want to focus on. Some focus on supports, such as uh, the Asperger Autism Network. They don't do research. They provide supports. And that's what they do. And then there's organizations such as uh, Organization for Autism Research, which is more of a scientific, research-based organization. And uh, fortunately, with this organization, I'm on their board as well. The focus is on supporting autistic people. It's not about curing autistic people or making them as similar to non-autistic people as possible. So each organization does what they want to do, just as individuals do. And you can choose to either support the organization, not support it, or provide suggestions as to what changes you might like to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess just in the age of social media, you know, you see this kind of contagion effect with cancel culture. Oh, sure. And yeah. it just like with the, you know, hashtag ABA is abuse or, you know, whatever people say about Autism Speaks too. It's like when people jump on one side, it's really hard to show them a different perspective if people have already closed off to the idea that things can change. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, people can change. Things can change. I've met a number of people who were hardcore ABA, let's uh, therapize all of these autistic characteristics out of our kid type of person to people who, that same person who later on realizes that this autism thing is something to work with and not against. And maybe they realize that they might be autistic too. Mm -hmm. Well, I think your position as a prominent self-advocate will help to model this kind of open-mindedness for other people as well. That's my goal, is to make lives better for autistic individuals and to make fulfilling and productive lives for autistic people the rule rather than the exception. Yeah. All right. So back to the four A's. 
You also mentioned that you've done a lot of international presentations, educating communities on the ground. What are your impressions of how autism is viewed around the world, specifically in relation to the four stages you just described? Countries are in various stages of those four A's, and also organizations within countries. So I spent a lot of time in Russia and find that, just like I find everywhere, there can be these pockets of best practice or near best practice and understanding of autism, even though there might not be much in the way of resources in the country as a whole. So what I found when I started going to Russia is that there was a lot of focus on awareness. People were becoming aware of autism they were in that first A phase and now transitioning, seeing more transitions in organizations to the acceptance phase and working with autism and appreciating those characteristics. An organization that comes to mind is Our Sunny World in Moscow, led by Igor Spitzberg. And in this organization that has, it's not really a school, but people do come into the building. They have over 350 clients. They subscribe to matching approaches to individual needs. So they'll evaluate a person and then decide whether they go to the ABA suite because maybe that's what will be more helpful to this person or that person might uh, get referred to the floor time suite and they'll get floor time intervention or they might get a combination of the two. So uh, that's an example of better understanding of autism. There's a great organization towards the south in uh, Ukraine in Kiev, to be specific, called Child with Future, they focus on using the teach approach, which is a perfectly fine thing to do, to focus on a particular approach. Nobody can be an expert on all of them. But also, there's great understanding there that different approaches work for different people. So if what they can do doesn't help, they may refer that person to somebody else, or maybe they'll work on providing what that other approach is that could be helpful. Likewise, uh, there's another organization in Peru known as CASP, uh, the Center for, it's the Ann Sullivan Center for People with Disabilities, is what it is. And they've got an amazing program. It's not ABA, it's not TEACH, it's not Miller Method or Floor Time or one of the other approaches we know, but they've cobbled together something that works really well and providing support, and including people with disabilities in general, so autism and other conditions, in the community. So they've got a great employment program and other supports for people with disabilities. Now I'm seeing a lot of work being done in China in recognizing autism and finding ways to work with autism. I haven't heard too much... Uh, these days from about China, but I think uh, we'll hear more when the pandemic is over. Yeah. We have a couple Global Autism Project partners in China, actually, in Nanchung and Nanjing. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I've been to Nanjing. Yeah. There's a center there called U Plus Academy, where they actually integrate a lot of technology. It's really cool. I've never been personally, but I've heard about it from the founder of that center that they've developed a 3D mapping room where there are screens on the floor and on the walls and on the ceiling, and you can kind of walk into whatever scene that you want. So let's say you're teaching safety with crossing the street. Well, you choose that setting, and all of a sudden the room turns into a crosswalk. Oh, that's interesting. So you can practice safely without real cars. Mm -hmm. They're doing some really cool stuff there also with teaching social skills and, for example, spotting different circles of color on the floor and having the children move along in kind of like circle time, you know, so that they're able to take turns and follow a routine that way also. Oh, okay. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So I look, I look forward to when it becomes safe to travel again and 
seeing what's being done in China and various other countries. So when you go around the world, <laughs> are you invited to these places, these organizations? How do you connect with them? Are they looking for a speaker? Yeah, that's uh, pretty much how it works. It's uh, mostly word of mouth. I don't do any hard advertising or promotions. Uh, some people do. I guess some people don't. But it's more by word of mouth. People hear me speak at a conference, and then they want me to come to their organization and talk at their conference or do some kind of consulting, giving workshops, whatever it might be. Yeah, that's pretty much how it works. So when you arrive at the organization, let's say, are you then able to do an assessment of where they lie along the four A's and then adjust your presentation accordingly? Yeah, I do, because it's important to provide people what they need. So I have about 18 different presentations, and usually what people want will fit into one of those topics. However, sometimes topics will be mixed and matched. And very often, there'll be something new that I need to add to a presentation because it fits what that organization needs. So the presentations uh, continually evolve from one to the next. Mm -hmm. In your experience, have you found a particular country that is really moving along quickly along this pipeline and reaching that level of appreciation where they're actually creating job opportunities specifically for autistic people? Well, I think it's probably easier to talk about organizations within countries, uh, unless the country is really small. Okay. So, for example, in uh, Qatar or Qatar or however you pronounce it, I know when I go there, they pronounce their country. It's not as Qatar and not as Qatar either, but it's something somewhere in the middle. Yeah. They're doing a lot of work. And in fact, I'm doing going to start some intensive work with them on employment, setting up an employment program with them with the Qatar Foundation, uh, with a colleague of mine, uh, Robert Nassif, to be specific. And what they want us to do is set up a program for individuals on the spectrum uh, so that they can uh, find and maintain meaningful employment. Part of that also includes developing awareness and training for potential employers as well. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's an example of a whole country. It's a small country, so it's a little bit easier to manage. But as you get to some of the larger countries, uh, such as you can include the United States as well, it's more regional in nature. There are places in the United States that have excellent supports, and services, and everything you could ever want. But there are also some places in the United States that are just as lacking in supports and in need of education, starting with awareness, that you might see in uh, some of the more challenging areas of the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And it goes the other way, too. Some areas of the world where there isn't much at all, but you find these pockets of best practice. Mm -hmm. What are some common challenges that you see across countries when trying to move from that level of awareness to acceptance? I think it's uh, making people more aware of what autism is and what it isn't. So what that means is dispelling myths of autism. Mm -hmm. Dispelling those myths and assumptions that people make about autism. And helping people to understand you can learn a lot more about autism by getting to know autistic people. What are some of those myths that you come across? Well, some myths include all autistic people are computer geeks, is one. Another one is autistic people don't have or perceive other people's emotions. Whereas, in fact, in many cases, I find that it's the other way around and that we may be too much in tune with another person's emotions and feelings, but don't quite know what to do with them and might get overloaded in some way, mm. which then could cause a shutdown and make it seem like that we're not aware of another person's emotions. Mm -hmm. So those are two. Got it. So in your work, you're 
presenting as an autistic person. So they're able to see firsthand and talk to an adult with autism. I know we have a partner in Saudi Arabia. They work primarily with young children. And I was asking them if they know any adults with autism that are self-advocates kind of speaking to their communities and showing what autism looks like, not only in childhood. And they couldn't name anyone. Hmm. Yeah, so that's so uh, we need to do a lot more work in uh, Saudi Arabia as well. I've been to Saudi Arabia twice, and uh, I saw a lot of uh, good effort being made when I was there. So it would be interesting to return to that country to see what has happened between then uh, and now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and our director of outreach at the Global Autism Project, Cassie Hardin-Scott, she talks a lot about the steps to community outreach and how we really need to empower parents to empower their children to become that self-advocate that's representing their communities. Right. So it really starts from within. I mean, it's great what you're doing as an outsider coming in, but they also need to see what autism looks like within their own communities. Oh, it sure does. And that brings up another challenge, which is important to address when working internationally. And that is autism strategies and concepts and whatnot is not something that you can export. What that means is that it's very important to make sure that you're culturally relevant, mm -hmm. maintain cultural relevancy. So with the work that we're doing in uh, Qatar, we are putting a lot of effort into making sure that whatever we do is culturally relevant. And an example might be is that when I talk about employment, one important strategy at least in the United States and in similar countries, is to uh, get the child involved in doing chores at home, making the bed, feeding the cat, keeping the house clean. And that can work well in many, many cultures. But there may be other cultures where it's just a part of that culture that somebody else does that and is a caretaker of some sort. And if that's the case, then the opportunities for doing household chores just don't exist. And so can't recommend things that don't exist in a particular culture. And you have to become aware and sensitive to these cultures, to these differences. And you can't say they're good or they're bad, they're just differences, and you have to find ways to work around them. So that way that will prevent a uh, problem with recommending things or suggesting things that just aren't going to work in a particular culture. Yes, exactly. That is basically the motto of the Global Autism Project as well, do with, not for. When we go into these other countries and we're providing training to their local staff, we're working with the teachers and it's a constant assessment of what is important to them, what is socially valid for them. Right. Because if we come in and we just put in our own Western ideas of what it means to live a quality life, then it's not going to be sustainable. It's not going to stick when we leave for them to continue on in whatever teaching they're doing with their kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. It's important to get to know another culture, to be accepting of other cultures, different ways that people do things. And that's just part of what we need to do with autism as well. So as we look at these autistic characteristics, we need to turn away from thinking that perhaps they're bad mm -hmm. and just removing value judgments and just saying, well, that's just the way it is. Sensory issues just are. Differences in communication just are. They just exist. And now the question is, what can we do to work with these differences? Yeah. With the person who doesn't speak and probably will never speak. So. Can we find another means of communication and work with that? And likewise, in various cultures, there are just some things that will never be done in the United States that are done in other countries that might be helpful in the United States, but that's just not done here. It's not the culture. 
And then we can flip it around too. There's things that we do here that aren't done in other places. So we need to work with what there is. Yes, exactly. Can you maybe tell a story of a time that you were out in a different country and you had to really practice some cultural humility, like maybe something that was surprising to you in that moment and that you had to actually stop yourself and think twice? Yeah, well, maybe uh, I think it was China that I was at. And uh, I was talking about the need for supporting adults and for individuals who are at autism level one, formally diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome, because the focus seemed to be on early intervention of people with more significant challenges. People would be diagnosed at autism level two and three. So I was talking about that people in other portions of the spectrum need supports that they need, and also adults. And the response that came back is, we know adults exist. We know that people with Asperger's syndrome exist. However, at this time, we only have the supports. We can only get support for people who are more significantly affected. Hmm. So it was that point that I suddenly realized, all right, let's work with what is and then expand things as resources and time allows. And what I found in countries, different countries, is that it is those individuals who are more significantly affected who are noticed first and provide their provided support first. And every country except one, and that's Singapore, hmm. where it's worked in the opposite direction. And that's probably because a parent of a child with Asperger syndrome had good connections in government and a lot of support. Mm, mm. So there were these amazing supports for people at autism level one. And you can go to the Pathlight School of over a thousand students with Asperger syndrome there. And it's a state of the art facility. What about individuals who are more significantly affected? Well, there wasn't much there in support for those with more significant challenges, was provided by the Department of Recreation and Parks. So not even an educational. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so there wasn't much there at all. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, however, over the past 10 or 15 years, there's been much greater recognition of people with more significant challenges, and they are now receiving uh, supports that they need to get. So they've evened themselves out. So just as most countries seem to progress from people who are more significantly affected and much more noticeable to those with Asperger's syndrome or autism level one or adults, Singapore went in the other direction. Oh, wow. That is fascinating. Yeah, it is. And good for them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That also reminds me of some of our partners in Africa. We have actually our longest standing partner in Kenya. And they just opened another branch of their school in Tanzania. And they've talked to us about the stigma of autism and disabilities in general in that area of the world. And it's scary because some of these kids are really in danger, especially the ones who have significant needs that you can kind of spot out in the community in public, maybe because they're stimming at a grocery store. And there is a genuine fear that they're going to be kidnapped and killed because it's thought that they might be possessed by evil spirits. And, you know, at that point, it's like these families are keeping them at home for their own safety. You know, it's like you need to start there also and address that so that they are better equipped as parents to handle whatever behaviors might come up, whatever meltdown might come up in public, and maybe even train them on what to tell other locals around them to use that as a teaching opportunity and educate people about autism. Yeah, exactly. And in that way, we can increase uh, public awareness. And again, that's where it starts, of what autism is and what it isn't. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of myths uh, that need to be addressed. 
a colleague of mine told me, who's from India, uh, told me of a situation where this person was uh, walking around on his farm and uh, unexpectedly uh, came across a nest of vipers, poisonous snakes, and he killed them. Maybe they were attacking him, who knows, but whatever, he, uh, he killed them. And then sometime later on, that couple had a baby who had a cord, his umbilical cord, wrapped around his neck and resulted in cerebral palsy. And the belief was is that the, those snakes had come back and exacted revenge on their child. Mm. Yeah, there's a lot of superstition that goes on. Right. And it's hard in these areas of the world where maybe you're trying to battle religious beliefs and show science instead. How have you handled those situations when maybe you're talking to an organization or a family that is still very much on that side of awareness? Yeah, well, it's a, it can be a big challenge. And sometimes it's just a matter of working with what is. So if you have someone believing that the spirit of the snakes came and attacked your son and caused this, this situation, it's not really something that you could change, but you can still provide support with where the child is now and what are some strategies to help that child lead a fulfilling and productive life. Hmm. Yeah, I see that. So not necessarily contradicting their beliefs, but again, working with that. Yeah, exactly. So uh, as we've talked about a few times already, it's uh, really a matter of working with. Mm -hmm. All right, Stephen, we have a question from one of our listeners on Instagram, self-advocate MV. And she wants to know, what are best practices to support autistics in the world today? I know you've already kind of answered this in regards to focusing on what's best for that individual, but maybe this could be a good opportunity to weave in what your ideas of meaningful inclusion strategies are. All right. So meaningful inclusion is when both the autistic person and the others that, who they're interacting with, be it in a classroom, be it at work, be it in the community, everybody benefits from the situation. And that's when you have true inclusion. Sometimes I see what I call geographical inclusion. And that is where the autistic person, a person with a disability, is in the same room, is in a regular education classroom, but they're off in the corner doing something uh, with their paraprofessional or support person that has nothing to do with the rest of the class. And they say that's inclusion. Well, I suppose it is. It's geographical inclusion. So doing what you can to make sure that that person is meaningfully involved in whatever the activities are. And it doesn't necessarily mean they're doing the same thing as everybody else, but they're still meaningfully involved. I've seen situations where you have an autistic person who wants to be involved in a school football team, for example. But due to various reasons, they're never going to be a football player. It's just not going to work. Maybe for physiological reasons, maybe for cognitive reasons, whatever it is. But that very same person is still intimately involved with the team as, for example, the hydration manager. And make sure that everybody has sufficient liquids to remain hydrated or something else. And that's an example of engaging in a related activity, but still being meaningfully involved in the situation. So that's, that's an example of inclusion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I used to work for an AB agency in Oakland, California, and I was assigned to some schools in Berkeley. And at that time, this was, I think, 2017, they had just shifted the whole district to full inclusion, and it wasn't working. It was exactly what you're describing, where the student was in the room, in the corner, with the one-on-one -on -one therapist working with them, but just completely 
excluded really from what the rest of the class was doing. And it was also not fair to the teachers who weren't really trained on how to include the student meaningfully. Right. It was just kind of this overnight change and, you know, you kind of deal with it. And she's there, Manny, or he, is there trying to manage 30 plus students and not having the tools to really help that student succeed. So it was, it was really frustrating for me as, a, as the BCBA on the case coming in and trying to help them, but they just didn't have the resources or the, really the time outside of the classroom to really learn these extra strategies. Yeah, and then that's another big challenge is proper support for educators to understand and support their autistic students. Yeah. So it really is a kind of, if you look at it from a holistic point of view, you know, there are so many different moving pieces and how can we best provide the right environment, not just for the student, but for the other students in that classroom as well. Yeah, exactly. And that gets into the whole area of accommodations and curriculum modifications. And uh, what I've found is that modifications that are made, be it in a school situation or be it in a workplace, while they initially may seem expensive, take a lot of time uh, to put together, these modifications end up benefiting other students as well. Hmm. And really are just extensions of good teaching practice or just in general good inclusionary practice. Could you give a quick example of what one of those modifications could be? Yeah, yeah, I sure can. So, for example, some modifications that are familiar to most people are access ramps to buildings. Expensive to especially retrofit, and maybe they look kind of ugly too, but we need to support people who have mobility impairments. And now they've, about what I see is that people with two perfectly good working legs walking up an access ramp and not taking the stairs because it's easier. And certainly anybody who has a heavy object to wheel into a building will appreciate coming into the front of the building instead of having to go to the loading dock in the back. Closed captioning that we see on TV programs, on YouTube, and various other videos. Mm -hmm. Initially, just for people with hearing impairments, but anyone who's been in a noisy airport, a noisy bar, or some other noisy situation that will make hearing a television impossible appreciates being able to read what is happening at the bottom or the top of the screen. So that's just an example. A couple of very general examples. In education, it might be that, and I've gotten these requests, a student requires an advance organizer every day for every class meeting, which is really just an agenda. Uh-huh. Uh, wouldn't everybody benefit from having that agenda? Yeah. Either on the board or as a handout. Sometimes I'll get a request from the student of office support. Such and such student needs a copy of the teacher's notes. Mm-hmm. My initial response is, well, I don't have teacher notes. <laughs> I don't write out everything that, I, that I'm going to say, mainly because it just takes, out, takes too much time. But what I do have is a copy of the PowerPoint presentations on the course management software that all students can access and download. And so I'd send that back to the student support office, and the response will be, oh, that's really what the student needs. So you're all set. You don't have to do anything. Hmm. Yeah, that's a great tool that can help for the rest of the class too. Right. And as we think about environmental modifications, be it for lighting or ventilation or just being in a quiet space to learn, everybody benefits from that. And it makes me think of some hotels that, I don't know how much they do it now, but they used to make a big deal about having these special hypoallergenic rooms. We'd be in a quiet part of the hotel. It'd be hardwood floors instead of a rug so that it'd be kept clean. They'd have all natural bedding with high thread counts. And it would be, the room would be cleaned with uh, organic or natural products. And then my 
question is, wouldn't everybody want that room? <laughs> yeah. So just do it for all of the rooms instead of just a few. Right. So it's, th it's things like that where improvements that we make for autistic people tend to benefit everybody else. Mm -hmm. And in the workplace, I think about supervisors, a number of supervisors have remarked to me, now, all this work that I've had to do to better communicate with my autistic employees has made me a better manager or supervisor overall as I communicate with the rest of my staff. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, being more direct, for example, right? Right. Yeah. Okay, Stephen, I, I want to switch topics and talk about disclosure. You mentioned earlier that you disclose to your students that you are autistic. Right. What tips do you have for other autistic people when disclosing either to their professor or to their employer? Oh, well, that's a good question. And when one is disclosing, there's usually a reason. And that reason is self-advocacy. Otherwise, there's no reason to say anything. So when we disclose and when we advocate, the first thing we need to consider is whether the effect of being autistic significantly impacts a situation or a relationship, and there is a need for better mutual understanding. And if that's the case, then we need to think about an advocacy and disclosure plan. If there isn't, then there's really no reason to talk about it. Hmm. So, for example, for a while I taught statistics at Emerson College in Boston as I was finishing up my doctoral degree. And uh, certainly I know, uh, you know, I, I know that I'm autistic. Would it make sense to disclose to the class, the statistics class, that I am autistic? And there didn't seem to be any reason to do so. So I never did. Okay. But then again, is there something to advocate for that significantly affects the relationship? And so if I was doing it again, probably would be some sort of what I would consider as a partial disclosure. And the reason why, what is the effect of autism? It takes me all semester to remember student faces. So I might, might have said to the class, if it looks like I don't recognize you outside of class, it's because I don't. And the reason why is that I am really bad at remembering faces. So that's the disclosure. It's a partial disclosure. I didn't talk about autism. I just talked about the specific aspect of autism that's causing the challenge. And then why did I bother to disclose in the first place? Well, it'd be really helpful to me if you reintroduce yourself to me outside of class if you have a question. So that's the advocacy piece. And making sure that I advocate in a way that the other person can understand and provide support. And maybe it's even just one sentence. Yeah, gee, I wonder if it's okay if I wear this hat at work? Because those lights are really bright and they give me a headache. So that could be another form of advocacy. A full disclosure Sometimes that's more appropriate, such as uh, you're dating and you're getting into a relationship with somebody. That person should probably know fairly soon. Or, in my case, if I'm teaching a course on diagnosis and intervention in autism or giving an autism presentation, in that situation, it makes sense to do a full disclosure. Right, because it's relevant to what you're talking about, too, and people can get a sense that. It's coming from a firsthand experience also. Right. And how about on the topic of disclosing the diagnosis to children when they're younger? Because I know this comes up with some parents who aren't really sure what's the right age, you know, and if we are really trying to break that stigma, you know, it should come early enough that the child can form a positive impression of what autism is in their lives, right? Yeah, well, I think uh, it should uh, come early. The sooner, the better. It needs to be done in a uh, developmentally appropriate manner. 
So you might not be talking about autism to the five-year-old, but you might be talking about, remember yesterday when you had a really hard time and the bus was an hour late and you had a meltdown? That's because uh, your brain works differently and it's harder for you to wait or to deal with something that's unexpected. However, at the same time, the way your brain is wired, it makes you really good at some of these other things. So in that way, you're talking about differences, but you haven't gotten to the label yet. And I think by the time you get to the label, that's when a person should be very familiar with their strengths and their challenges and accepting of them and working with them. And then finally, the label is the last piece of that proverbial puzzle that helps explain why things are the way they are. Hmm. Yeah. What do you think about ID cards for people, especially to prevent any kind of dangerous police interaction if they're stopped in the street because they're exhibiting some behaviors that call attention to police officers intervening? Do you think it's appropriate to then show a card that says, I have autism, so that it can kind of mitigate any negative consequence? No, I think that can be very helpful. It's always a person's choice as to whether they use a card, but it's better to have it when you need it than not have it when when you need it. So having some sort of ID card like that can be very helpful. The police have been doing a lot of work on awareness of autism as well. I've done some work with uh, some police departments, such as NYPD. We even developed a training video for their new recruits so that they can recognize when somebody might be autistic mm. and when they might be encountering an autistic person and that things may be a little bit different. You will have to be aware of differences in communication and eye contact and various movements that for the police officer in normal situations suggest um, that somebody is guilty of something. Mm -hmm. But it might just be the way the autistic person perceives and reacts to the environment. And having an ID card can certainly uh, be helpful. Yeah. All right, Stephen, we are coming to a close here, but I do have one last question. What advice would you give to other self-advocates who are looking for ways to move society along the four A's towards you know, that appropriate level of appreciation and action? Um, I think it's uh, basically just being out there in the uh, community. And however that is done by that person, for some people it's more electronic in nature, on social media, for others it's physically being out there. Uh, with the pandemic, it's been mostly electronic for everybody, but before and then eventually after will be safe to travel uh, and be able to do more of this work in person, and also teaming up with other advocates, because uh, we can be much more effective uh, in numbers. So getting to know other autistic people in the community, seeing what they're doing, working on collaborative efforts, either joining other people's efforts or having people join your efforts. Because working together, we can do much more than any one of us can do alone. Yes. And how can people learn more about you? They can look me up on the internet, uh, com. If you go onto YouTube, you'll find a whole bunch of, a number of videos of presentations that I've done. Uh, you can also find me on Facebook. and. LinkedIn. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing your ideas with us. Oh, it's my, my pleasure. Great talking with you, and I look forward to when we can work together in person. Thanks for tuning in to Autism Knows No Borders. As Stephen pointed out, we still have a lot of work to do in order to move from Awareness to acceptance to appreciation to action. If you're a self-advocate wanting to share your life experiences or a professional working in the field of autism education, 
Our Skill Corps Volunteer Program is an opportunity you don't want to miss. The Global Autism Project provides sustainable clinical, administrative, and leadership training to autism centers seeking guidance. As a Skill Corps member, you can travel to our partner sites around the world and work alongside their local teachers and therapists. If you'd like to learn more about our Skill Corps program, check out episodes 4, 17, 53, and 66, featuring Skill Corps volunteers that have been to our partner sites in India, the Netherlands, Indonesia, Dominican Republic, and Kenya, to name a few. Listen to them talk about their transformative experiences and see what Skill Corps can offer you. Just a reminder, we're currently accepting applications for a Skill Corps volunteer program to travel in 2022. Begin your journey today at globalautismproject.org forward slash skillcore. That's S-K-I-L-L-C-O-R-P-S. As a listener of our show, take advantage of the coupon code to waive the application fee. It's Autism Podcast, with no space in all caps. Thanks for listening. Take care. Tune in each week for engaging conversations of how people across the globe are inspiring change and building community. You've been listening to Autism Knows No Borders, brought to you by the Global Autism Project. You can find Rachel's notes for this episode and learn more about today's guests at autismknowsnoborders.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please kindly rate the show and leave a review. By doing so, you'll be helping us increase awareness and acceptance of autism around the world. You've been watching Autism Knows No Borders. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Also, we'd love to hear from you, so let us know what you think in the comment section. Click here to watch another interview from our podcast. You can also find us on your favorite podcast app. Tune in each week for engaging conversations of how people across the globe are inspiring change and building community. Thanks for watching. Take care.